flavor and um, I'm sure a lot of the discussion later on can pick up on some of these topics. Thank you. Thank you, Svenja. Fascinating stuff. Um, our next session will explore how organizations can become more sustainable and what sustainability means in the context of ESG. Please welcome to the stage uh, independent risk and resilient consultant Gareth Byatt and CEO of Soteria, Sarah Gordon. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, very interesting discussion so far and um, uh, really good to see the, uh, the, the debate and, um, and uh, the, the awareness of uh, what's happening here. Um, Sarah, I'm, I'm looking forward over the next half an hour or so, we'll try and leave a bit of space for some questions as well from, uh, from people to, to hear your views about, yes, climate, but also uh, perhaps other aspects of what we see as sustainability in ESG. I know you have a lot of experience in different sectors, so I'll, I'll look to drill into that a little bit if I may. Um, but I'll, I'll start just by asking um, a little bit about your, your background and, and your, your own journey, journey in uh, sustainability. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much, Gareth. And it's a real privilege to be here with all of you today. And I think the discussion so far has been absolutely fascinating. So my name is, is Dr. Sarah Gordon. I'm CEO of a risk management and sustainability consultancy called Satala. I'm originally an earth scientist or a geologist, however you want to frame it. Um, and so my background, my academic background is about understanding how earth works. Now, when you talk about climate deniers, many of them do actually come from that geological space. And having been a trustee of the Geological Society, I've had many a fascinating debate with regards to what is the difference between natural climate change and anthropogenic climate change. Because our climate has always changed, but we're seeing massive differences that are going on at the moment. I was lucky enough to attend COP26 last year, and I, I found it really interesting what you mentioned about almost the emotion inside a COP and actually what I found as well was the discussion was very much about sustainability so what are we leaving for future generations what are we creating rather than destroying for future generations that was more the debate or the discussion that was very much inside COP what then gets portrayed outside of COP is quite different I think there's almost some very kind of sensitized messages that that come out of COP um, like to come back to your original question, Gareth. So, so why am I sitting here today? Well, from a from a personal perspective, and let me put the microphone back on again. Um, from a from a personal perspective, so I started out life as an exploration geologist, which means that I had the most amazing job of flying around the world looking for things like nickel and copper and rare earth elements and lithium. So all of the stuff that we need in our wind turbines, our batteries, our solar panels, etc. And whilst I was doing that, working for a mining company, I thought, well, hang on a second. Surely we can be extracting these materials from the ground in a more responsible manner. There are ways in which we can improve on how we dig this stuff out of the ground. And through this journey, and there's a very long story that sits behind it, it was a case where I was working for a company that truly does believe in sustainability. But do you get sustainability at that decision-making table? Does sustainability really sit alongside the financials when you make a decision? And sustainability is, yes, it's about the economics, but it's also about people and it's also about nature. So it's a case here of how do you bring those different aspects of value together? And I thought, OK, what tool can I use to bring together different aspects that might be in conflict with one another with huge amounts of uncertainty that if we don't pay attention to it is going to impact on what we're trying to achieve? And thus, I encountered the world of risk management. And so that's a case here where risk management or integrated risk management is a mechanism through which we can get real sustainability to happen. So that's a little bit about my background, Gareth. Okay. Right. <laughs> and I think I'll probably come back to that point about integrated risk management and ask you for a few examples of how it's stitched in. But just before I do, um, 
so you've, you've, you've touched upon a few core parts of what you see as sustainability, yeah. uh, about it being related to people and the planet. Um, of course, the United Nations with the Sustainable Development Goals talk about peace and prosperity for the planet and, uh, and people, of course. Um, what about ESG? And is ESG and sustainability, are they one and the same thing? Are they peas in a pod? Are they different aspects, different lenses? What's your take on that? So I think you'll get a different answer depending on who you speak to about that. And it was interesting to hear John's answer um, earlier on today with regards to ESG being a very financial mechanism, for example. And I think it depends which sector you go and speak to. Often, currently, ESG, I think, is, is the latest three-letter acronym with regards to what is the mechanism through which we try and achieve sustainability. So you referred to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, of which there are 17. They are things like eradicate poverty, living in a just society, protecting life on Earth and beneath the, beneath the surface of our oceans, etc. These are big aims, big goals, and they're fantastic. But when it then comes down to, okay, so what do I actually need to do? What does my organization need to do? What do the people within my sphere of influence need to do? that's when the likes of environment, social governance and everything that comes with it can come to the fore. Okay, so it's a, I'm not going to say it's a mechanism to realise things such as the SDGs, but it's getting into actual action. Yeah. Right? So yeah. action. Yeah. So can you give us a few examples of that? Let's say starting with you, you mentioned uh, your background as a geologist and mining. I know that you work with various organisations in, let's call them heavy industry, um, so, with that in mind, and ESG being action orientated, what are you seeing as some of the material type of challenges, risks, threats, and opportunities? Of course, we know mm -hmm. that it's upside and downside. So, in, in heavy industry, mining, and others, what are you seeing as some of the, the, the tangible uh, aspects and outcomes that are being realised at the moment, and some of the challenges that they're grappling with? <laughs> so um, it's, it's useful that we've only got, got half an hour. Yeah. Exactly. Um, <laughs> where do I start? <laughs> um, well, I think, I mean, when you're looking at the environment, the social and the governance, the first thing is that no matter what sector you're in, you're going to have conflict between different aspects of that. So, for example, um, from an environmental perspective, we need to be able to move from burning fossil fuels into renewable technology. Now, the, the thing about renewable technology is it itself is not renewable. Every solar panel comes from, is made from non-renewable elements and materials. Now, yes, we can recycle some of them. We don't have the technology yet or the scientific understanding to recycle all of it. And in fact, if you look at steel recycling, I know we've got Adrian over there in the corner who knows more about this than me. If you look at our ability to recycle steel, the lowest quality steel is the steel that has lots of nasty contaminants in it. But those contaminants are things like 0.38% copper, 0.41% nickel. Now, you would open a brand new fresh mine to dig that out the ground. So this is something here where in terms of how do we get some of those environmental aspects fixed, so we need to be able to create this technology from the materials we dig out the ground, but we also need to be able to dig these materials out the ground without disturbing the biodiversity, without harming that environment in a really nasty way. So how do we go about doing that? And mining as a sector has got a catalogue of disasters where we as a sector have got things really badly wrong. The other thing with that, though, is then you bring in the social aspects and you think, OK, well, say, for example, cobalt. Approximately 65 percent of the world's cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. So that is a part of the planet which is really challenged in terms of society, in terms of how people live. I almost got stuck there just before COVID unraveled. That would be very exciting. I would have had one hell of a two years, for example, if I'd, if I'd got stuck there. Um, this is a case where the ability to dig that material out of the ground and make sure that the wealth that can be gained from that material in terms of financial value, but then also in terms of the development through people developing social enterprises, etc. If you get this right, there is huge opportunity that is out there by looking at the ESG aspects to something like mining rather than just the financial aspects to mining. So with mining and other heavy industries, yeah. 
given us some great examples of the E and the S of yeah. ESG. The governance side of things, where does that play in? And, and for those organizations, uh, businesses, and, and others that are involved with uh, these industries, what are they doing at the moment? What are some of the challenges? They yeah, so, okay, so governance, so, so environment is probably the easiest bit of ESG because it's relatively easy to measure. It's relatively easy for us to get our heads around. Social is really difficult because you're dealing with people and it's a very different mindset to understand what is going on with those social-related threats and opportunities, so i.e. risks. From a governance perspective, this gets interpreted by, in different ways by different countries, for example, around the world. Typically, when you're looking at governance from, say, a mining perspective, you'll be looking at, well, where are you and what is the uh, sort of jurisdictional governance that's sitting there? What's the national governance within that particular region? But then you're also looking at the governance within a company. So how does that company behave? What is that company culture? Do we comply with various different regulations or do we try and do better than them? Do we pay our tax? Do we feel that we've got a speak up culture? So all those things that we were mentioning earlier on today, what is the culture of the organization? And it's the governance bit of ESG that actually allows it all to hang together. And it's through there that we actually get the accountability to say, OK, yes, I'm going to hit net zero by whatever date. It's the governance aspects of ESG that says, OK, are we actually hitting it or are we going to miss that target? What are we going to do about it, etc.? And it keeps it very, very dynamic. Right. And in some of those businesses then, mm. does that mean on that governance point that as well as at a clearly important board level, directors level, executives, strategies and things like that, it's actually infused throughout across, I'm not going to say top and down, across yeah. the organisation so that... Um, so that uh, in whichever part of that particular organisation they're in, they're actually making change happen. Are, yeah. you, are you seeing that? Yeah, I mean, I think increasingly, increasingly so at the moment. So um, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Australia at a big mining conference there. Um, and I went to it um, expecting to be disappointed and was very pleasantly surprised. It was great because actually this was a case here where across multiple different disciplines, people were talking about how do we make sustainability real? Not greenwashing, how do we make it real? Now, I was surprised by that because back in May, I was at another mining conference in Canada where CEO of a very large company stood up and said, we've been doing ESG for generations. Society just needs to catch up. I thought, wow. <laughs> How out of touch are you? That is not where we need to be. So I think this is something here where people are recognizing that ESG is hard. There are bits where if you do the right thing for the environment, you might be doing the wrong thing for society. So how do you balance up those pros and cons? Also, there's a huge amount of uncertainty with regards to climate change. So climate change is the ticking clock for sustainability. We do not have time for proofs of concept and waiting to find out what the right answer is. We've got to be prepared to fail in a lot of areas in the hope that some of those aspects are going to come through and are going to allow us to go through a just energy transition to be able to combat some of that as well. And I think that that is really beginning to land within, say, the mining sector, but also other sectors as well. Quick shout out for Australia as well. As an Australian citizen, I'm pleased <laughs> to hear that, um, that you found that um, things are, uh, there are some good positive things there. Um, conscious of time, but um, I would like to be able to understand also your viewpoint and perspective from some of those you speak in other sectors as well. I know you're working um, and across uh, different types of uh, sectors and you, you, you get to meet a lot of different people. So what are you seeing? Uh, again, give me a few um, actual actions and examples that... Um... Yeah, so, so for example, um, we're really lucky. So we work with, for example, um, a number of different pharmaceutical companies. And so with regards to sustainability there, it, a lot of the discussion is around access to medicine. And so, and this is something here where when organisations are putting together the sustainability strategies, Often there's a lot of focus on things like diversity, which is great. There's a lot of focus on giving to charity. Again, fantastic. But organizations forget, well, who are we? What's the sparkle that we can bring to the world? And if you are a life sciences organization, then making sure that people have access to medicine 
that's your bread and butter. You are experts at that compared to somebody like me, a geologist. What do I know about getting, making sure that everybody has access to medicine? A little bit more now, having worked with the pharmaceutical sector, just to say that. But also as well, things like sports. So, I mean, the two of us, Gareth, we work with one of the world's larger football or more famous football leagues. And that's, again, is saying, OK, well, as that, yes, we've got all the, the normal sustainability aspects. But what's our sparkle? What can we actually bring to the world that allows us to move forwards with regards to the sustainability agenda? Okay. So that, obviously finance is part of that, but it's not all about money, right? Absolutely not. No. And I think, um, so the, the oldest millennials are now in their 40s. And, the, and I'm, I'm being very generalist with regards to this. I was speaking to Chris, who's sitting over here. He proudly told me he's one of the last millennials. So congratulations, Chris. But this is something here where there's a change in terms of how, how society, and I'm being very generalist here, and perhaps very specific to certain countries around the world, how do we value our lives round about us? Now, traditionally, money has been that big metric that we've used but no more. The younger generations really care, and I mean really care, about the environment and about society. Now, we don't quite know how to measure those aspects, which makes it really difficult to then value them. But at the moment, we've got the great resignation, or let's just call it the great move, because I mean, people aren't just resigning and sitting at home and doing nothing. They're all doing something. And this is a case of how do you attract talent into your organisation? As we heard earlier on, a lot of the conversation is around, well, what do you do with regards to sustainability? And that is half of the world's population actually saying, do I want to work for you? Do you have the kind of culture that I want to be a part of? Are you actually making a difference in the world? It's not all about how much money can I actually put in my pocket. It's a much broader range of values that are there. Right, right. I think I've got one more point before I then open up and ask people if they have any particular questions. And it, I think it's, it's, it's linked to several aspects that you've, you've mentioned. And I just want to quickly touch upon um, e explaining as an organisation what we do. So reporting, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few different mechanisms out there. I'm not sure how mature they are in terms of the E, S and G, but what are you seeing in terms of reporting about what we're doing um, is the balance right between focusing on doing things and then uh, reporting it externally? Yes, yeah, so I think, I mean, with regards to greenwashing, etc., the, the problem that we have with that is people reporting things that aren't necessarily real or perhaps spinning things so they're perhaps better than what's really going on. But I think the world, the world is, is more intelligent than that. And we're beginning to see people asking the right questions. So if you take, so I think one of the um, perhaps successes of COP26 was actually the UK government saying we're going to make TCFD or the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure mandatory for UK companies and or large UK companies. And we've seen mass trends across the world where suddenly everyone goes, we have to do this thing called TCFD. What on earth is it? And of course, risk management is a core component. You've never seen the word risk mentioned more in a document than the guidance behind TCFD, which is great for those of us who are risk managers. But that's something there where in terms of the reporting, we're really beginning to get into the nitty gritty of where is the tangible action and change where we're moving things forward. And it's OK to say last year, if you said we're going to hit net zero by 2030, we've actually gone away and we've thought, hang on, what's the context of the world? What are the threats and the opportunities that we face? What's our ability to actually do something about them? We can't hit that target. We need to restate it. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. So I think what you've got here is you've got a uh, constant evolution with regards to the reporting mechanisms allowing people to ask the right questions and then allowing, so from my perspective, allowing the financiers and the investors to ask the right questions. The way to get a mining company, for example, to change is not to give them cash to do bad stuff or not to give them insurance. But then on the flip side of that, if you want that mining company to change from an insurance perspective, we need to take bigger chances on new technology on how to get that material out of the ground. And so this is a case here of every single sector needs to be going, where's our revolution, where we can change what we are good at in order to help this interconnected constellation or system that sits around us. And I think at the moment where we're perhaps stuck in our whole action and accountability, 
perhaps we're still stuck in giving to charity rather than saying, what's my sparkle? What can my industry actually do? And if insurance did this and changed that, or if mining changed this, or if transportation or construction changed that, what does that then mean in terms of that seismic shift that we need if we're going to address something like climate change? The final comment on that, I think, is, so going back to 1996, we're still talking about global warming, or where's that tipping point? We're past the tipping point of climate change. And I know that that sounds really horrible to hear. We are, we're past it. We can either curl up in a ball and cry, or we can say, no, where is the opportunity to say, what is the world going to look like in 2050 or whatever. We've just gone through 8 billion people on our planet. We're a tiny little rock, very fragile, flying through space at high speeds. It is in our hands, it's our duty to say, how do we stay within those tolerance levels so that we as human beings and all of nature, etc., can actually survive on that rock? That is what we're trying to do here. Sounds like risk management is uh, front and central to, uh, to making that happen then. Great. Of course. <laughs> of course. Um, uh, I'm conscious of time, but I think we have time, don't we, for a couple of questions? If anyone has one, yeah? We've got time for a couple of questions. To Sarah, that is, not to me. No, you can ask to Gareth. Go for it. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm Helen Hunter-Jones. Um, I'm really interested in particularly the mining sector and traceability. Mm -hmm. So if we look at what's happened in the apparel industry, as a consumer, I have a lot more access to the supply chain and yep. I can make informed choices. Do you see that kind of traceability coming through from mining? Yeah, you do. And I mean, this is something where depending on the commodity, so the material, some of them are easier to trace than others. So something like a diamond, for example, it will generally have impurities in it. So you can fingerprint it back to where it maybe came from. And that's something where the technology and the mechanisms to trace something like a diamond has really stepped up since um, um, people became aware of blood diamonds, for example. And the consumers began to say no. I don't want to have that on my finger or, or whatever the case might be. Um, similar things are beginning to happen with regards to, say, for example, cobalt, um, because so much of it comes from one part of the world. Um, depending on how it is extracted, it can cause major human rights abuses, for example. So you are beginning to say, see things like ledger systems like blockchain, for example, being used for some of that. The key thing is if you go all the way back to the beginning of how is that material actually extracted from the ground, um, the timelines that are included within that are huge. It can take upwards of 30 years to go from finding that cobalt to actually opening a mine. So you've got a huge amount of time that's there. You then might have that mine open for a number of decades, but then the actual benefit of it, so that post-closure phase, should last for centuries. So how are you rolling all of that into the traceability of what's going on with regards to those materials? One final thing on that. So I've been recently over the, since COP26, um, involved with the UK government putting together the first ever critical mineral strategy that we've ever had in the UK. And one of the reasons why they put that together was we suddenly went, oh, help, if we want to build all these wind turbines, where on earth is that material going to come from? Well, we live on a very small island. And whilst, yes, we can dig some lithium out of the ground in Cornwall, etc., most of those materials need to come from abroad. So therefore, we need to leverage our ability to trade and also to use different you know, kind of research and development, etc., to extract those rocks in more responsible ways. What, what are the assurance mechanisms that go into that to make sure we're not just raiding Angola for rare earth elements to bring them home to the UK so that we can use them? So there's a huge amount of thought that's going in there. Um, so really good question. It's coming. It's not there yet. Hello, another mining question. Annemarie from Swiss Re, by the way. And um, we are uh, working with companies such as Glencore, which we have leveraged to their Swiss company. We can talk to them a lot, help them on the sustainability trajectory. 
But how about the companies that we don't have leverage to in the mining sector that because they are governmental from a government we don't speak to, for example, or um, in another way uh, we don't have access to them and they have significantly more also opportunity to reduce and become more sustainable. How do we access them? How can we work around that? That's a really good question. So I think this then comes down to the mapping out those supply chains and who actually buys from those companies where we don't have the mechanisms of, say, within the UK, the financial sector has massive opportunity to implement that governance. And we've seen that, for example, with regards to bribery and corruption, for example, really beginning to grow some teeth recently. And similarly, with regards to insurance, obviously, as well, which has been great. For those, for those companies or for those organisations that don't require that because they're state-owned, as you've quite rightly said, that's a case of they still sell to somebody. So who are they selling to? And are those customers actually doing their proper due diligence, going perhaps to their um, tier one, two, three, four, how far up that supply chain to say, well, where is that copper coming from? And what ESG credentials does it bring with it? This goes back to things like using things like blockchain, but then also using satellite imagery. We can see it from space. We know what they're doing, but are we willing to pay the price tag that is needed to pay for that data that, that comes with it at the moment? One of the things, for example, in the UK, if we, said, if we turned around to our car manufacturers here and said, OK, every single vehicle that's produced in the UK needs to come with an ESG ticket to say it's proving that all that material has been sourced responsibly, they'd go bust straight away. So we destroy our car manufacturing industry. So this then comes back to that balancing act of how do we improve the responsibility and the provenance of that material while still managing to keep the economy or that particular industry actually rolling at the same time. So it's a case of how willing are we to go and get that data to actually assure ourselves that something is, is responsible. It's a great question, though. We've lost the microphone. <laughs> Hi, my name is Gracieli. I come from Chile. I work for a state-owned company, mining company. I'm Brazilian, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, so all eyes in the Amazon. Yeah. Right? And we always talk about accountability. Yeah. So I like the value chain concept we heard because we're looking forward, but we also need to look back on how the North Hemisphere had contributed to carbonization. Mm -hmm. So we cannot put or pass on the bill yeah. to the Southern, right? So it's a common, a common problem. But I, I wanted to just say that all the companies are selling copper, for example, and the LME, the London Macto Exchange, is a very good organization, so it's good news, right? Mm. To help regulate, okay? So the, the copper that's sold around the world has got uh, standards, and the yeah. market rejects the understandard copper that, that's been tried to be traded or to be sold. So this is very good news. It's, it is regulated. Is that enough? Maybe not. We, are, we always need to rethink and to keep looking at it. But I mean, just to give you the, uh, to, to not to leave the impression that state-owned companies do not follow the rules. They do because they need to sell to somebody. Yeah. And, and, and today the power distribution um, is, is a key in our society. So, yeah. so we need those metals and, and what we need to have a different look is how as a society we are going to help change and make mining more sustainable because this is what you use and consume every day. So this is my statement. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is something where at COP26, I heard the word mining twice and it was all, and both times it was in conjunction with coal. The entire world thinks that the mining sector is just about digging coal out of the ground and burning it, which is, which is not true. So therefore, OK, should we just change the name of the sector and call ourselves the raw materials sector or something like that? That might help. Um, but also to come back to your comment about the 
um, so state-owned mining companies, absolutely, there's a different form of governance that comes in there, and especially in somewhere like Chile, where there have been big looks at the constitution, etc. And so that's something where if you're buying copper from a state-owned mining company in Chile, actually, you could say it's coming with better ESG credentials potentially than a private-owned company. And it's just that the, the, the levers in terms of who is providing that governance look very different. For somebody like Glencore, as you mentioned, the onus is on the investors to hold Glencore to account to say, prove to us that that cobalt coming from the DRC, for example, is produced in a responsible manner. Prove it. And it's the same with regards to the customers. It's the same when we come to, say, Chile, for example, where you've got the, the government actually saying, well, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to provide the funding for this. So it's, it's similar. It just looks slightly different. Cool. Ooh. I think we've got time for just one quick one. <laughs> Thank you. I, I just wanted to reflect on your comment that you made that it's okay for organizations to, I guess, restate and say that they've made an error. Mm. Do you think it is actually okay, though? Because it feels like the societal values that we have in place at the moment don't allow for mistakes on topics like this. So do you actually think that organizations can restate if they've made an error? I think they have to. If, if you say we're going to be net zero as a company by 2030 and you realize you can't do it, if you then keep telling the world we're going to be net zero by 2030, are you lying to the world? You're lying to yourself. And so I think this is something, so if you look at TCFD, most organizations, so in their first TCFD report, their scenario analysis, which is a core component part of that, was just a group of people sitting down in a room and having a chat. They said, okay, maybe they did some quantitative climate, you know, kind of from a climate changing perspective. But with regards to actually saying, what does it mean for us? What controls are we going to put in place? People hadn't done that yet. And so what you're seeing there is a constant iteration and, and it's just the risk management loop of us saying, can we actually do this? And of course, what we've seen over the last nine months with, for example, Ukraine, et cetera, is a massive shift in our context. So coming back to, John, I think you were talking about double materiality. So that's a case of saying, well, what's happening in the world that can impact on us, but what are we doing that can impact on it? Um, and the latest thing is it's, it's dynamic double materiality, just to add to the jargon, because things are constantly changing. And so that's something where, we need to keep thinking, is that the right target? Can we improve it? Not just, are we going to miss it? Can we improve it? Can we go through those step changes? And I think that that honesty is actually what is expected of us, rather than just saying, yeah, we're going to be net zero by 2030, because we're not, necessarily. <laughs> Good question, though. Thank you. How are we doing for time? That's it, I'm afraid. Yeah? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank right, you very thanks, much, Gareth and Sarah. <laughs> So we're now going to take a short break uh, with refreshments being served downstairs in the Maxwell Library. Uh, see you all back here at 12 o'clock when we'll be discussing some of the latest climate-related liability trends. Thank you.